Hi everybody, welcome back. Again, I'm Tom Chapman. This is part three of my Map Tool tutorials. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about creating a narrative outline. And I thought about this uh, quite a bit because I also need to talk about tokens and maps. And I decided that uh, one of the best ways to introduce a lot of those concepts is through the narrative outline. Now the narrative outline, if you think back to the introduction video, was what I showed you with my Curse of the Crimson Throne campaign that I ran for Pathfinder. Now in that, I took the entire adventure path for that publication for part one, and I put it all in map tool so that I could click on it, and I had some sort of a flow chart so that I could follow it through. So what I'm gonna do today is show you how I use narrative outlines and why I use them. Now first, I mainly use narrative outlines for published games. So what I'm going to show you today is a module from Pathfinder. Uh, I would also use it with um, Numenera games where I have pre-published adventures. When I run a custom game that I build myself, I really don't use a narrative outline. I usually have a pen and paper method as it is mostly in my head, and I just react to things as the players do it. Um, I find that using this narrative outline for published campaigns, though, allows me to write notes and have them exactly where I need them and have things branch in ways that make sense, especially for more complicated uh, adventures. Now, for this example and many moving forward, I will use the Paizo Pathfinder module Crypt of the Everflame, though I think this works with any published game. Now here's what I'm going to use to do all this. Of course, as you see on your screen, I have Map Tool. I am also going to use Foxit Reader, where I have Crypt of the Everflame open. And last, I have an Office uh, document, such as Open Office Writer, or you can use Microsoft Word. Uh, just so you know, if you are looking for a PDF reader, I find Foxit Reader to be a very good one and I will include the download link in the description below. So going back, the first thing I need to do is I have this brand new map, as you can see in front of you. This is the default map. Everything that you see here is what will happen when you open up your map tool for the first time. So what I need to do first is set up the map. So I'm gonna go up here to where it says map, and I'm going to go to edit map. Now the first thing I like to do is I like to number my maps. And the reason is, let me exit out of this, is up here where it says select map, when you click on that and you go between all your different maps as you saw in the introduction, they're ordered alphabetically. And that often doesn't work because I need to go to the fifth map, not the fourth map, and trying to find it alphabetically isn't very quick. So what I do is I number my maps. And I do a three-digit numbering. So this one is my uh, adventure summary, my narrative uh, outline. So I go zero, 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 period. Narrative outline. Now everything else you see here is pretty much what I want. Distance per cell, five, pixels, 50. Vision doesn't really matter for this one, but I've got it uh, automatically set to 100, like we talked about in the last video. And then I need to come up with a background. The grassland just, it, is, it isn't easy to see, but luckily you can do a number of things. You can change the texture of the background here. So let's say I wanna do something fancy. Uh, this would be the entire map here, but that's still not very easy to use. So I use the swatches and I use black for my narrative outline. And with that, I hit okay. And I have my map. Now follow my mouse cursor down here. These two numbers are map coordinates. And so I usually set mine so that this uppermost corner is zero, zero, and that's what it defaults to. And so I pretty much got that ready to go. Real quick, I'm gonna switch over and tell you how I put the text in a way that goes into map tool from the PDF. So the first thing I do, obviously I already have my Crypt of the Everflame open. And with Foxit Reader, it's really nice because all I have to do is hit Control A and it selects all the text. Now I'm just going to hit Control C. And once it's all copied, I'm going to go to my word processor, whatever it is. And just so you know, for OpenOffice Writer, 
I don't want any of the formatting that comes with the PDF because that really starts to mess with things and you'll spend more time trying to fix that than any, anything else. So for Open Office, they have this really cool thing where you can hit Control Shift V and it allows you to select unformatted text and it puts all of it there. Now, if you have Microsoft Word, usually what happens with a newer one is when you hit Control V and it pastes in, it's going to put all this weird formatting in. But at the last line that's usually down here, such as where this trademark symbol is, it'll give you the option to do a drop down uh, menu and just select whatever is no formatting or remove remove formatting whichever one that is now if you come down here when i paste it in it is 63 pages and when you scroll up you'll see that the it's it's not very well put together so what it's doing is it's taking the columns that piso uses and it's using this skinny column and just directly formatting now this is the most time consuming part of what I do. So I come up to the beginning and I find the very first thing that I need. So this is actually where it starts. So I can just delete all this extra informa information at the beginning and start here. So this first part is just for me and I do want this. It's a little bit of description that I need. Uh, I'm gonna delete all this stuff and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna click in here and I'm gonna hit end delete space in delete space in delete space and so on and so forth until I get to the end of the paragraph and that's that now there's also something this is a personal thing I don't really like it when there's two spaces in here so I'm gonna hit control F I'm going to search for two spaces and replace with one, replace all. So that just saved me a lot of time. That's a personal thing. Uh, it doesn't, it's up to you whether you do that or not. So here I have this. I have just kind of a summary. Next I have the adventure background and I'm just going to do that. So I'm going to get this going and uh, I'll come back when I have this section edited. All right. So now I have my adventure background and my, uh, completely ready. Uh, one other thing that I saw in here, let's fix this. Apparently they put dollar signs in or somehow that went in for the letters FT. So replace all of them and there we go. All right, so now I have all of this. These first two sections, the adventure background and this opening statement are really just things that I need to know. So that's all for me. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to Map Tool. And I'm on this, and I'm going to go to Library. Now, under Default, there are markers. And this is my favorite one right here, just this plain, boring token that says Information. That's what I'm going to use for this entire page. Now, before I can drag that out, because if I just drag it out, it's not going to be where I need it to be. It's not going to be set up the way I want it to be. So let's go ahead and go over here to where it says Layer. Pretty much, this program always defaults to the token layer. What the token layer is, is when everything else is in place, it's your NPCs, your PCs, your monsters, your creatures, anything that moves that is sentient, pretty much. You know, oozes aside. So these are our NPCs and PCs. That's where that information is going to be stored. Hidden is where we would put things on the map that only we want to see. We don't want our players to see. So for example, in the introduction, when I was talking about those little room icons where I had all the information I needed about a room, I had those in the hidden layer. I could see them, I could click on them, I could interact with them, but the players did not know they're there. And as far as I know, most of my groups still don't know that they're there. Object is exactly like hidden, only if it's on the object layer, the players can not only see it, they can interact with it. So if you put an information token in a room and you put it in object instead of hidden and you are playing with this over the internet and a player goes, oh, hey, look, neat, a button, and clicks on it, they will see what you maybe didn't want them to see. Now, I haven't used this often. I used it once or twice when I first started the game because I thought it was cool that players could click on a treasure chest that I placed in the room and read, for it, read it for themselves. And there might be other instances I want them to do that, but for the most part, I don't use the object layer. Now the last layer is the background. This is where your maps and drawings go. 
anything on the background never gets interacted with. You can't click on it, you can't move it. It is a steady thing. Once it's there, it's there. Now, for now, I'm gonna just pick object because it doesn't really matter if I do hidden or object as the players should never see this map because it has all the information about the story that I don't want them to know that's for me. So I'm just gonna bypass the hidden layer and I'm gonna go up here to map and I'm gonna select player visible. Now I have this, map not visible to players. So that means if someone's playing on map tool on another computer and they're a player and they click select map, they will no longer be able to select the narrative outline. It doesn't even show up as a blank screen. It doesn't even show up for them. And that's what I want, just in case. So now I have that. I've got my object layer. My map is no longer visible to players. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna, going to select my information token and literally all I do is click and drag. And it's on my screen. Now I'm gonna Right now, if you see it, it's just kind of freely moving. Now this doesn't help us in the long run with making a neat looking organizational chart. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on it and I'm going to come down here and say, I want you to snap to grid. Now you can't see it, but there's a grid. Usually it's in black, so you can't see it on this, but there's a grid that this snaps to. So now instead of moving smoothly, it moves one five foot square at a time. And then I'm going to right click on it again and automatically it defaults to kind of a medium size. For this and to make everything work, I use a large size. So I have my large size information token. I'm going to click it and drag it up into my upper left hand corner. Now I have my first token and I'm going to open it. To open a token, you can do one of two things. You can right click it and go down to edit or you can just do what many of us would probably do anyways find the token and double click on it double clicking on it will open up this window here and this is where i store everything that i will use for this game is in these tokens now there's many different parts so there's the name so if it's visible to any player any player that hovers over this will see the name of the token the GM name shows up just for you. No one else will be able to see this. So for example, I might name this information and then adventure summary. Now I don't use label, so we don't need to worry about that for right now. Now, everything else that you see down here has to do with different parts of the game. For our purposes in this adventure progression, we're only going to use the notes tab and we'll go over some of these other ones later. So for now, just notes, and we have notes and GM notes. If you allow these tokens to be accessed by your players, they will be able to see everything in notes, but not anything in GM notes. So that's just something to be aware of. For now, I will just operate in our notes section. So I'm gonna start from the top. I need to take some information and put it into this token. So I'm going to go over to my Word document that I have going. And I took a moment so you didn't have to listen to me hitting delete and space and everything. And I did a large amount of this document so I don't have to really do much with editing it now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take everything from my first token, which is everything up to the adventure summary, and I'm going to control X so that I know that I'm done with that part. I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna hit control V and that all comes into this token. The last thing that I'm gonna do is since this is all adventure background, I'm gonna come up and name this token adventure background. And I'm gonna hit okay. Now real quick, I'm gonna go back in. You'll see okay and close. Be very careful when you exit something. If you put any changes in here and you spend a lot of time on editing it, make sure that you click okay. Close will close the window and will not store anything. OK will store all the changes you've made. So I'm going to hit OK. And now I'm going to come over here to the token layer. In order to select an icon or a token and see information that you've stored in it in a quick and easy way, you need to be in the token layer. So if this is correct, I'll come over here. My cursor turns into a pointer finger. And if I click on it, it shows me everything that I just stored in there. And now I can read it. 
this defaults to a pretty small font size. As you can see, it's somewhat small. That's smaller than my taste even. What I need to do is I need to go back in and I need to change the font size. So I'm going to click out of this. I'm going to go to the layer that this token is in and then I'm going to come back here and open it. Now with it open, in order to affect the font size, I need to start where I want to change the font size. So in this case, I am going to go all the way up to the top, up here where it says almost 200 years ago. Now, I copied this from another document, but in order to change the font size, it's HTML. So I'm going to put left caret, the words font size with a space, equals, and then quotation mark for quotation mark, right caret. Now, when I hit OK, that'll save that, go back to the token layer, and now that's made it quite a bit bigger, and I can read that. Now, the last thing that I want is I'm not very happy with where it says Adventure Background. I want this to definitely delineate between this section, which is kind of just your back cover introduction, and where the actual Adventure Background begins. So I'm going to go back to my Object layer, reopen this, and now I'm going to use bold. Again, this isn't really a word processing document, so that makes this kind of tricky in that I need to do left caret, B for bold, right caret. Now if I just leave it at that, it bolds everything that comes after that command. So I need to tell it when to stop. Go back in, and I want it to stop right after this. So I do left caret, slash, B, right caret. And this will now tell it to stop being bold after the word background. So if I go back to this, I can select that, and there we go. This would also be a great time to talk about the command for underlining. So if I want to, I can use the exact same command, only with the letter U, to create an underline. Now I want it to be bold and underlined, so what I'm going to do is I can stack them, and I'm going to do the same command, left caret, U, right caret, and then I'm going to go to the end and do left caret, slash, U, right caret. So what this does is now I have created an underline under Adventure Background. And that's just a little editing trick there. Now you can change the font size, bold and underline, uh, throughout the document. It takes a little bit of work to put it all in. But if it makes it easier for me to read on the fly, that's exactly what I want it to do. Now I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to reopen this because there's one other thing I want to show you. And I'm going to select all of this, copy it, and I'm going to go down here to GM Notes, and I'm going to copy it twice. Now the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you what happens when you put too much text into a token. And this is the one part that I'm not really happy with. It starts up at the top, and so I get to see all this. But in my GM notes, I now have overflow. If you look down here, you can see where the text continues. And zooming in and out, if you look down at my map coordinates, if I try to zoom in and out and try to scroll up and down, it'll just change the map size. But it won't affect anything in here. So you can't overload a token with a ton of information. You sometimes have to spread your information out over two tokens, but we don't need to worry about that for right now because there just isn't that much. So control A, delete, and okay. So now that I have my first token, it's time to make my next token. Now, if I go over here, I can see that the next token is adventure summary. Well, I'm still working off of GM stuff, so I'm gonna select this, and instead of creating an entirely new token and putting it in the right level and everything, once I have it selected, I hit Control C, and then I come over here and hit Control V. And now I have an exact replica of this token. So if I go to the token level, this says the exact same thing as this, only map tool defaults to the next number in a series to differentiate between these two. So I'm gonna open this up, and I need to do my adventure summary. So I'm gonna come here, select all this, come back here, and I'm going to be careful about pasting because I want to keep that font size. It works for me. So I'm going to select everything after the font size and hit Control-V. It saves the font size and affects the rest of the document. I'm going to take this adventure summary. I'm going to cut that, delete, and edit, and move it up here. 
Now that's the name of my token. So when I hit OK, I can say, all right, the new name of this token is Adventure Summary. And there's everything with font size 4. Now I've got one more thing I'm going to add in here. So select Adventure Summary, paste another one. I've got a second token. Open up using this adventure. Control X. This isn't really a necessary part of this adventure, but the information's there. So I'm just going to paste it, move this up, rename the token, and I'm done. Now, when I select up here, no matter what, when I select back into this box, the name box, it always defaults to the beginning. So if you go and you try to select from this direction, <laughs> it won't work. So just know that whenever you click back into this, it helps to just scroll from the left. And that one is complete. Now, before I add the actual adventure progression, I'm going to show you something. Uh, I like to differentiate the different parts of my adventure progression using different colors. So this stuff up here is just for me. I'll never read that to the characters or the players or anything like that. So I like to differentiate this with yellow. So I'm going to come up here. This is the interaction tool. This is what you default to. This is how you move and manipulate and double click. I'm going to come over here to drawing tools, though. And I'm going to block these boxes out with yellow. So I'm going to come over here to this draw a rectangle. I'm going to select it. I like yellow. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to left click yellow. Now you'll see when I left click yellow, it turns this left box yellow, but this right box is white. Right now, map tool is set so that if I come out here and click and draw, if I click and then drag, it creates a box that is white with a yellow border. That's not what I want, so I'm going to hit escape. If I want the inside of the box to be yellow too, I come to yellow and I right click it. So now the box is yellow both on the border and on the inside. Next, I'm going to come down here to background because I want this to be underneath the tokens. I want this in the background layer. And I also like my lines and everything to be at a 10 point width. This doesn't affect the box so much, but it'll affect some other things. Now I'm going to come over here and there's also another handy aspect that map tool has when drawing. And if I go kind of ballpark to where I want this to begin. So at the edge of this box and I hit control, and then I click and hold, or I click and then drag, it creates a box that snaps to the grid. So that's by holding control. So I'm going to just click again, and here I have this box. Now let's say you created something, and you go, oh, that is not at all what I wanted. That did not work. I need to delete that. So there's a cool aspect. You can either come over here and click on this eraser that's right here. Click lift up and drag and it'll erase it and then just remember to unclick it when you're ready come back over draw it again the other way to do this is when you select something in map tool shift will cause it to do the opposite so without the eraser marked i can just go oop that's not what i want shift click and it turns into a new eraser and without going back over i can just redo that oop, and here we go i actually need to redo that because box is too long. All right, 10 by 30. And there's all the information I need for myself as a GM. Go back here to my interaction tool. So my next step, if I come back here to my Crypt of the Everflame stuff that I have, is this is where the adventure really starts to happen. Now, the trail map, I don't really need um, for right now. Uh, this is good for me to know, but I'm not going to put that in. It's not necessary. I'm going to delete it and move everything up here. So my next token that I need for when the adventure actually begins is this entire introduction area. So this is actually information that I need and I might need to share with the characters. So I'm going to go back to Map Tool, go back to my Object Layer. I'm going to select just this token and... Let's have the adventure begin here. Open up this token, come back here, copy introduction, or cut it, name the token that, and then I'm going to select all of this text 
and this will be in my first introduction. Now I have a feeling, and we're going to double check it here in just a moment, that this is going to overflow my information. So before I get too much farther, I'm going to click OK and see how much information that has. Oh, it doesn't, but it looks like my text did not format correctly, and it didn't because I deleted it. So I'm going to come back up here, select the font size, copy it, OK, come down, and that should put it at the right size. Now let's see if we overflow. Nope, we're still looking good. Next, I'm going to look at some things here. And I know this, so this opening stuff is kind of just background. If anybody has any questions, such as the characters are all informed that they are expected to travel light, carrying only what they absolutely need. So this top part is kind of what they need to know something I can kind of paraphrase, but this is important right here. Give them a chance to speak to one another if they so desire. When the noon bells from the church toll, read or paraphrase the following. So this paragraph, this paragraph must be read to the character. So I need to set that aside. I like to do this with italics. So I'm going to go to my introduction token, come down here to, this is where I need to start reading out loud. Do the same thing. Left caret, I for italics, right caret. So left caret, I, right caret. And I want it to stop down here. So at this point, stop reading to the PCs. Now I can choose to add to this um, and add more here if I need more information or I want to do some more exposition. I also notice down here, continue on with the following narrative. I need to add some italics and then the italics end here. Now, when I click OK to make sure that that's good, I come back up here to my token layer, click on it, and now I can see, all right, I need to read this section to the PCs. And not only this section, but after I tell them about what they find in their backpacks and everything that they have, I also need to say this part right here. The mayor once again speaks to the townsfolk. And there I have the beginnings of my adventure. So I'm going to hit Control S. I've already got this Crypt of the Everflowing map, to to map Tool tutorial ready to go. Control S and let it save real quick. Now I'm going to come back down here and let's look at this. I have um, some more things going on here. Uh, I'm going to show you how I would do the narrative part and continue this on. So uh, we're still at the introduction. Quest of the Everflame is a subpart of the introduction. So what I'm going to do is since it's a subpart, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to select my drawing tool and I'm going to select my draw straight lines command. I'm still in the background, but now I want it to be green. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here with it in the background layer. I'm going to go to the middle of my token, hit control, click, and drag the equivalent of two squares or 10 feet on a game map to there. Hit escape and come back to my interaction tool, go to my object layer, copy that, paste it. Now be careful, I'm gonna show you, you can select multiple tokens this way. You'll see how they butt right up against each other. Be careful not to let them overlap. It's okay to let like monster tokens overlap, but just know that it's hard when they're that close and overlapping to select the token that you want. That's why I use large size tokens, because it's easier to keep them separated and to know that they're not overlapping. So there we go. I've got a copy of my introduction token. I've got it down the green line so that I know that that's another important thing. Going to come over here, copy this part, or cut this part. Be careful not to delete my font size this time. Nothing in here I need to read out loud to the party. I'm going to control X that and paste that there. Now I've just realized that uh, this is information that I should know, but it's stuff that the PCs could do. It's not side quest. It's not an extra attack or anything like this. This is really for me an information I should know. So I really don't want this green line. I'm going to come back here. And as I talked about, uh, I'm going to hit Control and Shift because now I want to erase. And I just got rid of that line. 
And I want to actually make this yellow. And there I have my yellow line. Now coming back to this next part, we finished the introduction. Now we're actually on to part one, Journey to the Crypt. All right, so come back to my map. Use my selection tool, object, select this. Make sure I'm at least 10 feet over. I'll go even farther because it's a flow chart. It does not really matter. And I'm going to connect these. Now, because it's part of the overarching back, backbone of this, I'm going to select red, control click, drag to the middle of that. And now that's where my eyes follow. Go back to my interaction tool, object, open this up, and start putting part one, journey into the crypt, journey to the crypt in here. Nothing in here needs to be read to them, so we will be okay. Make sure I don't cover up font size four. Okay. Control S. And now I have part one. Now the next part because I know something's actually going to happen during part one. I'm going to copy that token there. And this is actually involving players, so I'm definitely going to make this green. Control, click, and our first fight. Control X. Make sure I'm on that object layer and the interaction tool. And paste the name of it there. And I'm going to copy all this. Whoops. Went a little too far. I'm going to copy all this, control X, and I'm going to put it here. And there I have the first thing that happens. Now, I have some other things. So just so you know, this first part or this first encounter is an actual battle. Same with this eyes in the dark and so on and so forth all the way down. There are some other things that happen in here and both, but these first two things involve a map and they require a map if you're using Pathfinder and so I'll talk about that in the next video how to set up a map and then from there we'll talk about how to put tokens in for right now I'm going to go ahead and stop the video and I'm going to copy all of this stuff up to part two and I'm gonna put it in map tool so I'm gonna do that and I'll be back in a moment all right so now I have everything uh, input up to part two. So here's my flow chart. This is part one, Journey to the Crypt. I added the first fight information, Eyes in the Dark, Unfortunate Bandit, Treacherous Hillside, and what they find when they come to the Crypt of the Everflame. Now I'll show you some things that I did. Uh, I need to make a combat using the first fight combat map that I will add later. This one uses the Eyes in the Dark combat map, which I'll use uh, make later. I added some italics so I know what to read when the party gets to the edge of the Gray Lake. And Treacherous Hillside, I did something interesting because this had a chart in it that showed you a reflex save and, the res and what happens with the result that they get. So I just uh, added some bold for the numbers so that I could differentiate for myself and I could see it easily. Uh, oh, I forgot to add some italics here, so I need to go back and add that, and I'll do that later. And then I have what they see when they get to the Crypt of the Everflame itself and what they see and what they find on everything, which then leads us up here to part two, the upper level. And you'll see here, I have some stuff here, some information that'll be important to know, such as um, most of the most rooms of the crypt do not have any lights, so I need to make sure I know that. And then I actually start stop the flow chart here because if I go to my outline, this is where we start to have rooms and maps, and that's where we lead to the next part. So let me come back here. It says go to the upper level map, and that will be the next part of this video tutorial on map tool, part four, setting up a new map with tokens and everything. So that's what I have so far. I hope that was helpful for you. And I'll see you back here on part four.